Okay, go ahead, Jan. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 36 of the Photoshop Show. I'm Jan Kabili, and I'm so excited to welcome my special guest tonight, Claudia McHugh, a fellow Lynda.com Linda author, who's going to show us something that I know you're going to want to see, which is how to use channels to make complex selections and masks. And we also have with us some wonderful panelists. So rather than me bonker up everybody's introduction, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves, starting down below with our special guest, Claudia McHugh. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Jan. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, I have to admit, I am a really lousy photographer, so thank goodness you haven't invited me to here to give uh, photography tips. But I'm a pre-press person, and as such, I do a lot of color corrections, a lot of compositing, and I have to say that masking is kind of the secret to happiness for a lot of that stuff. If you want to select part of an image to color correct it, if you want to select part of an image and then bring it into another image, it's really, really a helpful skill. If you're silhouetting a book, yeah, you can use the pen tool. But somebody with frizzy hair or a dog, something like that, try drawing that with the pen tool. You'll spend the rest of your life. So I'm going to show you a way to create organic masks by using channels. So don't be afraid of channels. In fact, after tonight, I think you will think you're, they are your friends. Well, we can't wait. And tell us a little about you, Claudia. Where, you know, who are you and where do we Who the heck am I? <laughs> Um, I live outside Atlanta, kind of out in the sticks, and I've spent all my life in pre-press, so I'm really more of a mechanic than a designer, and so it's always been my job to take designer's files, well, actually I go back to before there were files, <laughs> I go back to before there were pixels, but uh, take files, analyze them, make sure that they're healthy, fix the things that aren't healthy, and then make sure that they're going to print correctly. So I actually learned all the software I know sort of by reverse engineering, by playing one lifelong game of what's wrong with this picture. So when I teach now, I sort of teach with an eye to that. Uh, I can't teach people design skills because I don't have the cells in my brain, but I can teach them the mechanics of building things correctly so that when it goes to print, by gosh, it prints the way they expect. Well, you're being way too modest. You know, I should tell you all that I, I so, Claudia is one of those people where I happened upon her when she was speaking, I believe, at a How Design conference. Is that right, Claudia? I, that sounds about right, yep. And that was a few years ago when I had the most exciting job at lynda.com. I got to go to conferences and look for authors, and that was pretty neat. And the minute I saw you, Claudia, I was like, you are a great instructor, number one. Oh, shucks. Thank oh, you. really? No, you just totally stood out. And number two, you know your stuff. And I think that may be because, as you were just explaining, you actually were a practitioner um, yep. doing it day to day. And that makes all the difference, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And like today, I'm today and tomorrow, I'm teaching InDesign to people who are, bless their hearts, they're in like in-house marketing departments who and their bosses think, oh, we'll get you an InDesign class and then we'll fire our design firm. I said, look, you have no idea what you're up against. You you don't understand the realm of printing. You don't understand the mechanics. This is a good part of it, but there's this whole realm that you don't understand and your boss doesn't understand that you don't understand. So you, know, you spend, let's not talk about how many years, in, in printing, and by gosh, you at least learn what not to do. So you've been doing a bunch of courses for Linda.com on printing. What exactly? What kind of courses? Well, I started out with a course called uh, Printing Fundamentals, which is just kind of an overview. Uh, and There's some wonderful footage in there of jobs running in a printing plant. Now, that may not sound exciting to you. Of course, I spent my whole life in printing, and still, I love to see paper go into one end of the press and printed material come out the other end. I love the mechanics of it. I love that sort of notion of making something from nothing. So... Uh, that's been my, that's been sort of my shtick. That that's been my mission, and I'm just tickled that the folks at Lynda.com think, by gosh, print is not dead. So I, that was like an overview, and then I'm breaking it down into what are called the the printing essentials now. So I just recorded one on packaging. It'll be a while before that comes out. I did one on spot colors and varnishes, and I'm going brain dead at the moment because it's been a long day. But I've done several others, and I've done a couple on Acrobat and on Acrobat forms, which is something I like to do for recreation. So. Well, that's really great to hear. I know that you know people who are working in the design industry and they have to go to print need to listen to your courses. Really, guys, these are among the best ones that I've listened to at Linda.com, and I've learned a lot. And so, I love your Lightroom course. So we are we have a mutual admiration society. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> well, great. Well, welcome. And in just uh, maybe uh, 15 minutes or so, Claudia's going to show us some great tutorials. Oh boy. Yeah. So Dave Bell, what have you been up to this summer? Well. Um... I've been 
working on some of my graduate research, which is, uh, well, I, I, first of all, I'm a teacher at a college here in Northern California, beautiful Napa Valley. And uh, my research interest is in photographer's use of social networking uh, to further the business. So I've been working on that, but uh, also teaching some summer courses. Um, so keeping busy at that and taking pictures as often as I can. Great. And Dave has really been such a great help um, with the production of the Photoshop show. We appreciate it, Dave. Thank you. Glad to be here. Erica Thornis, you had some news this week, didn't you? Well, I've been kind of busy this summer. I've been teaching and helping um, teach other local photographers all about underwater photography on the cheap without the big giant housings using bags and underwater point and shoots and reflected light. And I've also been kind of instructing and teaching local photographers about how to do silhouettes on the beach. And so I've been busy with both of those. And, you know, wedding season for me is just starting up for some reason. It's late this year, but, <laughs> it <is late. laughs> but it's going well. So I'm excited about that as well. And where is local? Where do you live? San Diego, California. My hometown. I was born. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, I'm really happy here. And the beaches are just fantastic this time of year. And so when you teach underwater photography, do you do it in the ocean or in a pool? Where? We do it in a pool. We do it in a local pool here. And we have a um, model and two or three photographers. And we rotate gear. And we just teach them some of the simple fundamentals that get them going. And it's a lot of fun. Everyone's been getting addicted. That sounds fantastic. You know, my son actually lives in Pacific Beach and has a startup there. He um, manufactures 3D printers. Oh, fun. Fun. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to come out there and visit him soon. And when I do, I'm going to come see you. Perfect. I'm looking forward to it. And we'll have to talk 3D printers, too. My husband's fascinated. Oh, great. Cool. Well, it's called Robo 3D. And he made like a jillion dollars on Kickstarter for this company. It's the most exciting thing. Wonderful. My husband's a physicist and is fascinated by one and wants to get one in his garage. Neat. So. And finally, we have Ron Clifford. Hi, Ron. Hi. How are you? Yeah, I was just in the background there doing the little technical stuff for the beginning of the show. Yeah, I've just gotten back from holiday. I, this is my first full day in the office, and it's it's. I'm just like I've been stuck to this chair the whole time. It's incredible. So if my eyes are a little bloodshot, it's because I've been staring at my computer screen, screen for the last 10 hours. Where did you go? I go, uh, every year I go up to a place on what's in Ontario, the Bruce Peninsula. It's a world biosphere reserve. There's a lot of rock, a lot of forest, and a lot of water. And so I posted a couple of images that I've taken. I have a, I have a lot to go through, of course, when you're away. Um, so I have a couple posted on my stream if you want to see where I was. And I've also announced for August, I have um, a couple of mentorships starting, speaking about teaching people. Erica's doing it in person. I do it kind of in person online. We're still face-to-face -face because we use the Google uh, Hangouts during the mentorships. It's pretty exciting. But uh, uh, we use pretty much all virtual tools. And I have a, a free one just starting up. And I don't even know if I could accept any more. And I haven't put it completely public yet. It's it is uh, right along with the show. It's on layers, uh, masks, and modes. I call it layers, masks, and modes. Oh my! And <laughs> um, it's just a basic startup for people who are struggling getting started in Photoshop to understand the really basic concepts of layers, masks, and modes, and how they really help your creativity. And so that's just a three-week, three-session program, and we're doing that through the Google Plus mentorship program that I uh, co-direct. And then I have two full programs uh, that aren't, aren't free, but they're really reasonable. And one is on enhancing your creativity, which is the one I've been running for two years now. And a new one on uh, discovering your, your personal vision. And that one has to do with people asking the question, do I need to shoot one thing? Do I have a signature? Do I have a style? How do I develop a style? Um, can I continue to shoot variety, or do I need to focus on one thing? So that mentorship covers that. Those all sound great. I wish I could take them all. <laughs> yeah. So, and do you use Google Plus Hangouts for this? I certainly do. Um, I do my best to have group Hangouts, and at least um, if people are available to do a one-on-one -on -one with each student uh, during the course so that I can address their needs personally. It's what separates things from taking a video course. Like you guys do great video courses, but there's, there's no one-on-one -on -one interaction for specific right. questions. And so the Google Plus platform allows me to do mentorships where I can put out curriculum, but I can also have one-on-one. -on -one. 
And so yeah. it's just a different uh, a different medium. It's really important, and and that's one of the reasons that I teach live whenever I can. Do you, Claudia? Oh, absolutely. It's and my favorite thing is to do custom training, so that I you know I have an idea of what they need, what they're capable of doing, and what they're going to be called upon to do. And it's fun to see the light bulbs go off over their heads and have them go, oh, this is so much easier than the way I was doing it. So, Yeah, it is really nice. Well. Except I don't know about you, but it's really hard to fit in custom training like when it's one client at a time because, you know, there's not a lot of empty days <laughs> when you're doing recording. And basically, we're writing books with our mouths open, um, t you know, month after month. So <laughs> if I could only type on my book while I teach a class, but I, I can't multitask quite like that. There are transcripts at lynda.com, though. Do you know that? You can click on the transcript thing, and basically everything that the author says is written out. I think it's for mm. people who are hearing impaired. And sometimes I just, you know, look at those to remember what I said real quick. It's interesting. <laughs> I love that. Because let's face it, stuff comes out of your mouth. And I said that. I know. It's, it doesn't read that well. I'll tell you. <laughs> I can read so much faster than I can listen, so that's yep. great. Yeah, it's a different thing though. When you're um, talking for recording, you don't necessarily put it in the same order, or have you know you don't you don't sound as put together when you read it as you would if you were writing writing it. Did that make sense? Yes, yes it <laughs> yeah. did. Okay. If you'd written it, it would have made more sense. Yeah, it would. Have. <laughs> it would have. All right, well, um, I was going to share my screen to tell you what I've been up to and also to give you some announcements about what's happening in the Photoshop and Lightroom world. So give me just a second to do that because I always think that showing is even better than telling. I agree. So what do you see now? Can you see my, my screen? Yes, we do. We see your screen. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right, let's see what have I been doing. Oh, so here's where I was last week. Um, I was at a conference in Chicago called Blog Her. Um, the most amazing conference. I love it. I'm going there since 2006. It's been in different cities each year, and it's grown from about 400 women bloggers to over 5,000 attendees, most of whom are women bloggers, but not all. Quite a few men attend now, too. Um, and it is just my favorite conference of the year because it's not like the Photoshop conferences and the design conferences. It's real people, you know. It's the audience. It, really, it's the audience. That's who comes there. Um, and it's fascinating to hear uh, the subject matter that women are blogging about. Um, so many things way beyond just technical, which is what I'm always thinking about. You know, everything from um, family matters to health to sex to food everything and it's really neat to meet everyone um, and party after party amazing swag I mean I couldn't even bring it all home I had to give it to the <laughs> housekeeping crew because I couldn't you know um, and they had a special day before the conference started called viewfinder day that was devoted to photography and video um, because of course bloggers need imagery and so that's the day at which I spoke and it was really fun and you know I love meeting the people and seeing them face to face and helping them out with their photos. So that was that. And I urge you guys, if you don't know BlogHer, go to blogher.com, check out the various conferences. They have, um, you know, not just the big BlogHer conference, but they have all kinds of conferences during the year. So you got to check those. They're fun. Oh, and oh, this was cool. I got to see um, three of my heroes, Sheryl Sandberg, who is the COO of Facebook and wrote the book Lean In. Have you guys heard of that? Can you Absolutely, yep. So that's great. And lean in, I don't want to, you know, I'll probably watch this when I say it, but it's basically about, you know, if you're a woman and you're in the professional world, you got to lean in to make it happen. It's not just going to come to you. You got, you can't sit in the back, you know, and it's all about that. And um, she sponsors this idea of lean in circles where you can meet up with other women in your communities and encourage each other to do that sort of thing. And so um, I'm going to do that. I think that's a great idea. Um, second, I got to see Randy Zuckerberg, who um, was the director of Facebook, and she had some interesting stuff to say. And thirdly, um, Guy Kawasaki was there as the keynote speaker, and he was fascinating as always, and he talked about his book about self-publishing. He calls it the eighth book. Um, it stands for Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur, which he says are the three prongs of self-publishing. So that was great. Um, 
And <laughs> there's more. <laughs> wow. And finally, I just wanted to shout out to Elisa Camelhart Page, who was a guest on our show um, about two or three months ago. Um, and her co founders of Blog Herd, Lisa Stone and Jury Desjardins, they did a great job. It was wonderful. I love you guys. Keep it going. Great. So that's about fantastic. Blog Herd. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, that's really rubbing shoulders with some uh, some pretty influential people. Yeah, it is. You know, and women and women are are online and are influential online, and that's the message. Oh, and I also met somebody from Google who got me on the list for Google Glass. Isn't that yeah, cool? That is cool. Awesome. Yeah. So after all these Photoshop shows, that didn't happen. I had to actually, you know, go somewhere and meet someone for that to happen. So that's that. And then. Um, uh, for then I came home and immediately went to the studio and recorded a couple more lynda.com courses um, and these are shorter courses which I think you're going to enjoy one is about um, enhancing portraits in Lightroom and the other is about um, enhancing black and white so converting to black and white in Lightroom and a little bit in Photoshop too and those will be coming up soon and in case you haven't seen it my latest uh, lynda.com course came out recently about using presets in Lightroom you guys love presets, don't you? I know Lightroom users like them. Oh, yes. So, but it turns out to be kind of tricky, and there's, you know, a whole bunch of stuff to tell about how you install presets, where to find them, what they do, etc. different ideas for different kinds of presets you can make and save. So there's that course. And then don't miss the Up and Running with Lightroom 5 course that I did, which is kind of my big Lightroom course every year, or every version. Um, yeah. And it is a streamlined, several-hour introduction to Lightroom as opposed to the giant go on forever Lightroom courses that you'll also find there on Lynda.com. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, so all that, that. That's a lot going on, Jan. Wow, busy, busy time. You know, one thing I really like about the presets, uh, just with the up and running of presets, especially if you find other people's presets, is that it lets you see how, how they achieved that look. And then you can, you know, dial it back and forth from there. and. I've learned a lot just seeing other people's presets. That's a really good point, Dave. That you know, you can basically you you apply a preset, and then when you look at the settings in Lightroom's develop module, they're all set to whatever wherever the author, you know, put them before saving the preset. Good. It's a good deconstruction tool. Okay. So anyway, so that's what. Oh, and then when I came home, my poor dog, he couldn't walk, so I was picking him up for you know three weeks trying to help him and. Um, he actually walked down to the corner um, last night, I'm happy to say, and back to the house. That's like such great progress. Um, so I'm very that's, happy for dog physical therapy. <laughs> yeah, that's meant, did you find out why that happened? Did you know what happened? That's fantastic news, Jan. Yeah, I don't know why. He's very old and I think maybe had a stroke. We don't really know, but I don't want to spend the money on why. I'd rather just work on getting him better. Yeah, oh, it's great to hear that he's walking. That's amazing. I know, I'm so happy. So that happened. All right, so anyway, but then outside of my little life, big things were happening in the Photoshop Lightroom world. Um, let me see here. Um, this week, Camera Raw was updated, or excuse me, not updated per se, a release candidate for, Candra, for Camera Raw and for Lightroom. They were both released on Adobe Labs. A release candidate means that it isn't the fully baked version yet of an upgrade, but it's all, it's been tested by private testers, beta testers. I'm usually one of those, and um, now they want Adobe wants the public to test them and see what kind of things they're finding about how uh, Camera Raw 8.2 works and how uh, Lightroom 5.2 works. And they're kind of parallel um, because you know both Lightroom and Camera Raw in Photoshop are raw converters. Um, and they have similar controls, and they do pretty much the same thing. So these two versions of the release candidate of these two programs are the matching, or you know, the same version. Um, I don't know how to explain that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So they're there for you to download, and you can go to labs.adobe.com, and for free, you can download Camera Raw 8.2 for Photoshop CC, and Lightroom 5.2. Be aware that if you do download and install Lightroom 5.2, it will write over your current version of Lightroom 5 if you're running that. So you would have to use 5.2, then uninstall it, and then reinstall 5 if that's what you wanted to do. Is that the same thing for the camera raw as well? Or can um, yeah, I think 
Yeah, I think so, but I don't. There's no reason you would want to go back okay. once you'd installed a camera raw. I don't think. Um, the, and these particular updates, both of which are, will be free when the finals come out. Uh, unlike some of the updates, they have really, I think, some significant and useful um, substantive features. And so in future shows, I'll go over some of those. But just to give you a little bit of a clue, uh, you can do things like um, in, in the color noise section of the detail panel in Lightroom and the equivalent place in Camera Raw, you can now get, you can smooth out your color noise. You have an additional control there for color smoothness. That's great. Yeah, that is. And then uh, on another thing you can do is if you use the adjustment brush tool to correct a local area, you could actually duplicate an adjustment brush and drag it somewhere else. You weren't able to do that before. You also have a feather control on the spot removal tool, so you can feather the edges of an area that you're trying to Perfect. cover up. Yeah, it's, there's yeah. some good stuff. I ran into that problem just yesterday. Well, now you have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, so those are all there, but if you don't want to try out the release candidates, you can just wait a short time, and um, after the release candidate cycle goes through, then Adobe will release the real Camera Raw 8.2 and the real Lightroom 5.2. So that's what's happening there. Um, and then, let's see, Bridge. I wanted to explain a little bit about Adobe Bridge. I think there is some confusion about what's happening with Bridge CC, which is the current version of Adobe Bridge. You know, Photoshop CC is the current version of Photoshop, CC standing for Creative Cloud, and you probably also know that you have to uh, subscribe to Photoshop now. You can't purchase it outright. Well, here's the thing. In the past, when you bought Photoshop, like Photoshop CS6 or CS5, you got Bridge for free, and Bridge automatically installed along with Photoshop. So I'm imagining that you guys and a lot of other photographers and other creative professionals used Bridge to organize and access their files. Did you? In the past? I have in the past, but I use Lightroom now. So. Right. I've been starting so, to use Bridge a little bit more um, when when I was losing files in Lightroom because I didn't have them properly organized. But it's not common in my workflow. Well, I think, you know, if you are a Lightroom user, you can pretty much leave the bridge to Photoshop workflow and go with Lightroom. But my experience when I'm out in the field is many people are still using bridge in Photoshop. They haven't switched to Lightroom. And even those that have find a use for bridge, for example, in Lightroom you can only see certain kinds of files, like you guys know what kind. Ron, you know what kind you can see in Lightroom. Yeah, DNG, your raw files, JPEG, TIFF, that's it. And PNG also. In, Can you say uh, PNG in, in Lightroom? In Lightroom 5, it's new, yeah. Oh, yeah, Brand okay. New. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, the, in Bridge, you can see all manner of files, PDFs, Flash files, um, video, uh, HTML files. So someone who is designing a website, for example, needs other kinds of assets beyond just photography, um, and so Bridge is very useful for that, for example, for one of many things. Um, and it's also useful, as Erica pointed out, when you get in a mess in the Lightroom and you just want to see your files, you know, figure <laughs> out what the heck is going on. Bridge is where, where I go to see the actual files because it's not a database, it's just a, a window into your file structure in your computer. Anyway, so Bridge was used for that by many people and over the years it had got more and more recruits. Well, all of a sudden in, in uh, CC, Bridge no longer automatically installs with Photoshop. If you want Bridge CC, you have to go and download it separately and install it separately. Now, you don't have to pay separately. If you pay for Photoshop or you pay for, uh, you know, the, the whole Creative Cloud bunch of programs, you don't pay again for Bridge. But you still have to go in there and download it from the Creative Cloud on its own and install it. It will not be there automatically. Did you know that? Wow. No. No, no. Yeah. Really. So that's a bummer. So that's problem number one. Problem number two. I'm here uh, on my screen. You can see a page at uh, the he Adobe Help, and I just access this by going to Bridge and going to the Help menu. Um, and but this Help is online, and on this page of Bridge, excuse me, in the Bridge Help, I went to the page called What's New in Adobe Bridge, and I put a link to this in a comment on the event for this Photoshop show, so you guys can see this too. On this page, it's allegedly telling you what is new in Adobe Bridge CC. But what really is new is what isn't there, not what is there. It's not great for a lot of people, but they've taken a lot of things out of Bridge. 
what they've put in is uh, the big thing is that it now works with the retina display that's what H high DPI support means yeah. so if you have a MacBook Pro with retina display it'll work with that mm -hmm. however some things we had in the past in Bridge are no longer here in Bridge CC. In particular, the Adobe Output Module, which is where, you know, remember web galleries? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where you could make web galleries, which were like these little mini websites where you could show off your photos in all these cool looking ways. Um, and you could put a whole web gallery online or you could just um, save it out and then, you know, give it to a colleague and they could see all your photos in a neat looking layout. That's not there anymore. You also could use the Adobe Output Module for making uh, contact sheets that were PDF in format, but um, pretty nice contact sheets, no longer there. So that's one thing. Second thing, there's no export panel. So you can't take a bunch of raw files anymore and just go to the export panel and export them out as JPEGs if you need to. There is no compact mode in Bridge CC, so you can't make Bridge CC really small on your screen used to be able to do that in previous versions so it was just floating on top of whatever else was open. Um, and there's more, a couple other things that we no longer have. So given that we don't have those things, what are the workarounds if you need to use those things? Well if you go to another web page on Adobe Help, and I give you the link to this in my comment on the uh, today's event on the Photoshop show, here you start to learn some solutions. There is another contact sheet making tool in Photoshop CC. It's the old one, the contact sheet 2. And you can access that in Photoshop by going to the file menu, automate, contact sheet 2. So that's one thing you can do. Second thing you can do is use Lightroom for your contact sheets and for making your web galleries, because Lightroom has the web module. I do do that. <laughs> there you go. And Lightroom is great. But if you're not a Lightroom user, that doesn't help you. And another thing you can do is Adobe kind of capitulated to the people who were doing the private beta testing who just were going nuts about the fact that there was no more output module you know keeping you from making web galleries and PDF contact sheets so Adobe has now made available a separate output module that you can download and install separately in your copy of Bridge CC and there is a page in the help um, which I'm looking at right here on my screen it's labeled let's see install Adobe output module and that explains where to go to get that Adobe output module exactly how to install it whether you're running Mac Windows 32-bit or Windows 64-bit so if you want to do that and I have done that and it works fine in Photoshop or Bridge CC you can do that now the final solution is you just go this is crummy I don't want Bridge CC I'm gonna continue to use Bridge CS6 if you were a CS6 user and you can do that and you can open files from Bridge CS6 directly into Photoshop CC you just go file open with and you choose um, Photoshop CC did that help a little bit helps a lot yeah, yeah, yeah I had no idea that, that was happening so that's good to know but like I say I'm a Lightroom user but I do use Bridge for exactly what uh, Erica had used it for I, I I shortened up my catalog and needed to go back to 2008 and I couldn't get it without going to an old catalog so all I did was load it up bridge and went back to 2008 and found the file so it was easier <laughs> yeah it is and you know bridge is still very an, I think an easy program to use here is my bridge CC and it looks just like it did before um, you can even see over on the right I have that output module I just installed it before the show by following the instructions on the page I showed you and um, then I accessed it by going to the workspaces here at the top right of bridge clicking the arrow and choosing the output workspace and then it brings up this panel on the right where I can make PDF contact sheets or web galleries so that's the deal with Adobe Bridge now one more thing if you need to know more about that or anything about updating upgrading Photoshop CC or Creative Cloud in general I urge you to go to this resource which is Jeff Tranberry's website called Jeff Tranberry's Digital Imaging Crawl Space. And basically, uh, the URL is blogs.adobe.com slash crawlspace. Why is this good? Because Jeff Tranberry is a wonderful guy. He's very good about um, you know dealing with Adobe consumers. He's a product manager at Adobe, but he is kind of officially called the consumer advocate guy. So he has this great website blogs.adobe.com slash crawlspace and any questions you have about 
all of these issues about Bridge and Photoshop CC and upgrading and what if you want to keep Photoshop CS6 can you still download it and how and where and third-party plugins and presets all of that you go to his page you find his FAQ and you follow his instructions huh. well that's what I wanted to tell you today and it is actually more than I imagined but there's a lot going on well thank you yeah thank that you. keeps us up to date and there's some uh, on the event page on Google Plus those links that you've talked about are all there and you've left a comment on there I can't put links into the YouTube uh, chat I just realized so um, go back to the event page on Google Plus and you'll get all those links that you just talked about can you put links under the YouTube replay of the show though can you in the comments no you can't put links in comments it okay. turns out I, I, you can put it in the description though okay yeah. so am I back can you see me now instead of my screen yeah, we see you now well, I am sorry to take so much time, but, um, so I'm going to shut up now and turn things over to our guest, Claudia McHugh. Yay. Okay. Well, let me screen share, and let's see if I can do that. Desktop. Start screen share. Move you out of the way. Okay. So, oh my goodness, thousands across the nation real enjoy. Um, what masking tool should you use? Well, it really depends on the subject that you're trying to mask. So in this case, I want to mask this dandelion and separate it from the background. So just a little rudimentary stuff just to kind of make a point. If I make a selection, if I close this file and open it back up, of course I'm going to lose that selection. And you do understand the official name for that active selection is Marching Ants, right? They've laughed at us for years, but it's now in the interface. <laughs> but if I want it tomorrow, I need to save it as something tangible. So I save it in an alpha channel. And all I need to do to do that is to go to Select, Save Selection. And I could give it an interesting name, but if I don't, I still save it. And I'm going to grab my Channels panel, which is fun to say, and pull that out so you can see here. There are Now this is... Oh, you got muted there. You're still muted. <laughs> oh, there you're back. Ah, so I can't even hold down the control key. Rats, because I have this wow. great little thing. You okay, I'll shut up and then I'll zoom and then I'll talk again. Okay. So I've just saved my marching ants as something tangible, and when we look at that channel, you can see there it is: world's simplest mask. So if you think of masks as being, in a lot of ways, like a stencil. So the black area is analogous to the, uh, to the cardboard, and the white area is the hole. So if I come back into my composite here and I activate that channel, I can go to Select, Load Selection, and I only have one alpha channel, so I can't miss. This is a way to limit what I do. So, for example, if I choose my paintbrush and I pick some icky color to paint with, Oh, little trick if you don't know it, you can use the bracket keys on your keyboard. Right bracket makes a bigger brush, left bracket makes a brush. And so if I paint, it's going to be limited to that area, okay? I have a question already, teacher. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you explain, you said alpha channel. I bet you some people don't know. What's alpha channel? That's not something you use in everyday conversation. Oh, please pass the alpha channel. Absolutely. <laughs> so when you look at my channels here, and it's probably going to mute me again, but let me zoom in a little bit. The RGB channel is referred to as the composite channel. It's just all the colors glommed together. And then the red, green, and blue channels constitute the color channels of this RGB image. But notice this little extra guy, and that's referred to as an alpha channel. And that's what, how Photoshop will name it by default. But as I said, you can name it whatever you want. But it's a place to store masks. Now, I don't do video work, but I know that uh, video folks use masks that are stored in alpha channels. So it's just it's a place that you can make your mask tangible, which means if I save this file, I open it up again tomorrow, I have that alpha channel, and I can reload it and invoke it you know, two years down the line if I want. So I, I think we're all clear on how a simple mask works. But that's a hard edge where it's white and black. There's a sudden transition, so you're going to see a hard edge. If I want to silhouette this dandelion and separate it from the background, 
just so you know, no way I'm using the pen tool. For one thing, I wouldn't live long enough to do it with the pen tool, and for another thing, it would be a really hard edge. If your natural bent is to use the magic wand or the quick selection tool, they have their limitations, and that's because they're color intolerance based. So if you use the magic wand and you click, it's going to run out until it feels the urge to hit the brakes based on sudden color change. It's always going to have a hard edge. Now you can use things like uh, like refine edge, and when I saw that I thought, oh, I'm a masking queen, my life is over, and then I tried it and said, yeah, I can still beat that. So <laughs> one of the problems with <laughs> And that's kind of my attitude about plugins too. Is it less than 99 bucks? Does it do something I can't do? Does it do something I can do but do it better or faster? Mm -hmm. And I have tried a ton of masking tools and I still come back to this. Now, I'm doing this in CC, which by the way actually stands for credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Cash Can I use that? That's great. Feel free, cash cow, whatever. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love Adobe. If I ever got a tattoo, it would be the big red A and next to it would be the InDesign butterfly. But uh, so this technique I'm showing you is in CC. This works all the way back to Photoshop 3, which I hope to God nobody's still using, but that's how far back it goes. They Come are. out of the caves. I, tell you, they are. I have it on a little laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never throw away all old software. But just so you know, you don't have to have CC for this to work. So let me zoom in on this. Oh, that's a little too up. When you're trying to silhouette hair or something like this dandelion or fur, one of the things that makes it a realistic mask is if you don't have a hard edge. So there's actually a little translucency in this, and especially in lighter hair and fur, that's true. You get a better mask if you maintain that translucency. So how do you do that? That mask that I showed you earlier where it's just black and white, that can't support translucency but that doesn't have to be just black and white, it can be shades of gray. Where you have intermediate shades of gray, you get translucency, and then you have a more realistic mask. But again, you don't want to do this with the magic wand, it is to let Photoshop help you do the heavy lifting. So, kind of looking toward the horizon, my goal here is to silhouette this dandelion from its background, because I want to put it into another image. So what I need is a dandelion shaped white hole in a black background. That would be my mask. So what I do is I start shopping through the channels to see which one is the most promising start. None of them is going to be perfect, but let's see which one does the best job. So in the channels panel, when you're doing this, you have to step a little carefully. If I click on the name of the red, now this is not the eyeball for visibility, but it's to say you want to talk to the red channel. Okay, there's the red, eh, not bad, and then the green, and then the blue. The blue's not going to work because where there are little green parts of this dandelion, if it's black here, it's going to hide in the mask that I finished. Well, okay, that won't work. Green isn't bad, but red, see how it sort of opens up in here? And maybe yeah. if I zoom in. So green, eh, red, ah, red's going to be my guy. Just duplicate that and then work on that duplicate to create my mask. Several different ways I can do that, but the most straightforward is to just come up here, distinct little area known as the panel menu, which gets smaller with each release. I figure if there's a CC2, that'll just be like a little smudge there. <laughs> it couldn't be because my eyes are getting older. It'll get down to one. No, it's definitely getting smaller. It'll just be one <laughs> pixel and you go, what? <laughs> Remember the good old days when it was a self-respecting circle with a triangle in it? No, those days are gone. All right, so I don't want to make a new channel. I want to duplicate my red one, so I just choose Duplicate Channel. Do I want to name it something fancy? I could. For now, I'm going to stick with red copy just to kind of drive home the point that that's what it's derived from. And when I click OK, you go, well, nothing happened. Yep, something did. See, I have a new channel. See it. You see it. And this is subtle because they keep making the type smaller. You can see in the tab you're now in that red channel. So this is, as I say, where you need to step carefully. You don't want to be doing what I'm about to do to your real red channel. You want to make sure you're doing it to this alpha channel. So the alpha just means that it's beyond the color channels. So what I need to do is make that background nice and solid and then maintain the interior. And the truth is, when you do this, Photoshop can help you to a certain extent, depending, and your success is going to depend on the contrast between the subject and the background. You're going to have to do some handwork to clean it up. But let's see what happens. Now, if you're accustomed to using layer adjustments, 
you can't use layer adjustments on channels. They're different realities in a way. I, I almost wish that the channels panel looked different from the layers panel. I wish the little channels were vertical so people would go, oh, those aren't layers. But Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, just something to, because they go, aren't those layers? No, they're channels. Those aren't layers? Trust me, they're channels. It, for me, the channels made sense because in the olden days, I output film. Cyan, magenta, yellow, black film. I had cyan, magenta, yellow, black channels. Ding! The light went off. But if you've never seen film, and children these days will never see film again, uh, you know, what do you hang your hat on for that? But here's what I need to do. I need to modify this. So I'm just going to use, you could use curves, but I just use levels. I used to look down my nose at levels. I'm no longer a levels snob. So image adjustments and levels. Here comes the histogram. And this background's kind of anemic. That's why we see, you know, a little famine over here. So as I drag the little black point slider, and I'm going to just go too far just so you can see what's happening, my goal is to have that background solid. If I push this far enough, you see how it erodes the detail here? That's yeah. not going to get it. So you'll find that in most images what you have to do is sort of juggle these ends. You want to kind of reclaim the light part. So I'll pull back a little bit here. But of course if I go too far that way, I'm going to get a little halo around it. So I couldn't, there's no set of numbers that's magical. You just kind of have to go by the image. And in the case of this image, the right side is not as brightly lit as the left. So I'm going to push it until I can get the right side good and solid. And then I'm going to come back and make a second pass on the left. But how do I know if it's solid? Well, you can kind of eyeball it, but it's better if you look by the numbers. So when you have a little dialogue up like this, you think you can't do anything else, but you can. I can go to Window and Info, and I think nice. I'll just pull that little guy. Really, could you imagine that you could do that? It's like, I didn't think I could touch anything else. Now, I can't, I can't point at what I'm uh, interrogating and come back here, but keep an eye over here by the K, by the black. Ah, see, I have 100 over there. That's good. And as I start to get over here, that background gets too light. So I'm good on the right side as I roll around. I'm good there. Okay. That's my first pass. What I want to do now is make this background on the left solid. I'm get my lasso tool, and I'm just going to draw up here. Now, I'm going to have to press the option key probably. Let's see if I can do it without it. If I run out of mouse pad, oh yeah. If you did have to press, why would you press the option key? I wanted to tell you, but I had the option key down. Uh, <laughs> How zen. Um, <laughs> reason being, the lasso tool, if, if you hold down the option key, it momentarily turns into the polygon lasso tool, which means you can kind of peck, 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 peck around. And if you need to like scratch or drink, it, you can take your hand off the mouse. So <laughs> it's a multitasking tool. So that let me come around here. You know, I could pick my mouse back up and, and get back on the bottom of my mouse pad. So now you can tell, uh, let me put it into quick mask mode. And you can see I'm going after this area here. Leaving the right with what I've done to it so far. And I'm going to now uh, go back to my adjustments and my levels. And I'm going to try to make this nice and solid. And you can see how different the histogram is now. So I'm pulling the black point slider. I'm glad I get to rewatch this. Because yeah. it makes no sense now. Uh, I actually have a tutorial, and Ron or, or Jan, I'll give you the URL for it. If you go to my site, to practicalia.net, there's a little button at the top for tutorials, and there's a walkthrough of exactly this image, which you might find helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. Because I don't expect you to remember this. Of course, I've done it for 20 years, so since I was a child, just so we're clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> World's youngest. Exactly. Uh, you, know, you might know what's really funny, and some of you young youngins have never heard of this. I was what when we, we used to composite images together, or when we build pages like for a catalog, we had to strip them up on clear carriers, and that job was called film stripper. And I was a journeyman <laughs> film stripper. And you can imagine how the introductions go. I, I met a friend of mine's mother who said, "Well, you seem like such a nice girl." I said, "Well, I'm a nice girl. I'm a journeyman." In fact, <laughs> you told her I'm a stripper. I'm like, oh, God. I, uh, I one of my first jobs was in a printing press, and I did film stripping. It was it was yeah interesting. <laughs> be tougher for you to say that than for me. Yeah, yeah, I was young and thin then. There could be some ambiguity. Not anymore. So it was okay. Ron. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, weren't we all? So you can see that this is starting to take shape. 
and it looks pretty good around the outside, but what's going on in here in the little seed pot? Now remember, uh, well, you can't remember because I haven't told you yet. Where, <laughs> where, it's, where it's white, it's going to allow that uh, dandelion to show through at full strength. Where it's black, it's going to completely hide everything in the dandelion's image. Where it's shades of gray, it's going to show through as translucent. Well, this is an opaque part of the seed pot. I can check by coming up here to RGB, not clicking on the name. I don't want to affect the RGB. I still want to be working on the mask, but I want to see the RGB. So I can sort of trace it. So I come up here and I click the little eyeball. Now I can see what's going on. It Ooh. might be a little hard to paint this up while I'm looking at that. It, again, it kind of depends on the color of the image. But it's a little refresher course. That, ah, yeah, that's all solid in there. So I said earlier, you're always going to have to do some handwork to this. So I want to fill in. Oh, that's too giant. Pod, and I can do it a couple of different ways. I'm a huge fan of keyboard shortcuts. I had a whole class today where I said, please, God, if you don't learn any other keyboard shortcut in your life, learn Command-C, Control-Z, and they're still going, edit, undo. But there's a chance that they bill by the minute, so that may not matter. <laughs> so here are some important keyboard shortcuts. Here's your foreground color. Here's the background color. The foreground color right now for me is black. If I paint... I'm going to paint with black. Background color is white. X, well, well, let me start with D for, no modifier key, you're just the D. Make sure that, it, by gosh, it's white and black, not a real light gray and a real dark gray. So that kind of cleans house. X, quickly, and save you having to make a big trick across your enormous monitor. So what I want to do is fill this with white. So I'm going to do it a couple of different ways. I'm going to start by using my paintbrush tool. So there's my paintbrush, and as I come over, I have great big paintbrush. And as I said earlier, one of the handy shortcuts when you're painting, you could go up here and change the size of your brush, but I'm too lazy slash efficient, so what I do is use the bracket keys. So on your keyboard next to the P, just the bracket. Left bracket makes it small. Right bracket makes it larger. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of stands to reason. But And here's another little addendum to that. Shift and the left bracket makes it a softer edge. Shift and the right bracket makes it a harder edge. So those Sweet. things just, <laughs> you like that? Some of my favorite trips. So now when I come in, I'm going to paint with white. Make sure that it's 100%. And just paint away. Now, I've got to get down in this little bitty corner here. I could keep making my brush smaller. But a variation on this is to get my lasso tool. And I'm going to need my option key. I'll try to time this just right. So I'm just going to carve away on this. Remember, we can't hear you when you're carving. Oh, oh I know. I wasn't saying anything. You didn't miss a thing. Okay. So, so it's what I'm doing with the option key is then it's, moment, as I say, momentarily, it's the polygon tool. So then I can just go peck, 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 peck around. So now that I've isolated that, uh, I want to delete to the foreground color. Now, I could swap my colors and hit delete. That would probably be the easiest. But if I hit delete, then this comes up. Oh, that, that takes up valuable microseconds, <laughs> for which you could bill, of course. So here's another shortcut I like. Uh, instead of having that come up, because I'm in a hurry, because, you know, customers standing over your shoulder, is it done yet? Is it done yet? As children, they were tough to travel with. What I do is I turn, I switch it so my foreground color is white, and then option delete, so I can't talk while I say it, option delete, or of course on Windows that's going to be alt delete, is French for delete to the foreground color. So now I've got, I think, a pretty good burn. Successful it is. It isn't a functioning mask yet, it's just, it's a sleeping mask right now, so it's not able to do its job. So I go back and I choose the RGB. So one of my, my big beliefs is work non-destructively. Don't kill innocent pixels if you don't have to. And I'll see people delete the background and I weep and it, don't do that. We want to hide them. We don't want to kill them. So I'm going to load that red copy as an active selection by going select, load selection. There's another way to do it too. You can drag it down to this little selection icon. There's, you know, 14 different ways to do everything. But now I have ants on my dandelion, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> the catch is that I need for need for this to become what's called a layer mask. Yes. 
it's a yes. Did that make you happy already? <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Good. One would hope. So, the thing is that this is a background layer, so it's glued down. You can't have transparency in it. It's it's like the carpet on the floor. You can't have anything below it. It has to be a floating layer before it'll let you do that. All you have to do to make that happen is just double click it. And again, you could give it a name, but eh, layer zero works for me. Click OK. And now you can see. See, he's a little floating layer, layer zero. I have my marching ants, and then here at the bottom, little guy, that little rectangle with a circle in it, add layer mask. If you have an active selection and you're in a floating layer and you click that, watch what happens. And there's the telltale gingham tablecloth that tells it that it's... Oh, yay! <laughs> but wait, there's more. So it, it's kind of hard to tell how good a job you did on this with it on that dadgum ding, uh, gingham background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close dadgum, an image here. Dadgum, well... <laughs> The first time I messed up a take at lynda.com, I said, Dad, gum it. The producer just fell out of his chair. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Who was it? What's his first name? Uh, Tom Mueller. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to arrange these little rascals so that we can see both of them and hide that little guy. So what I want to do is I want to transplant the dandelion into this, this other image. Let me clean a little house over here, reset my essentials. So I can actually just take this, get my move tool, come over here to my layers panel and just grab it by the image and then drag it over there and transplant it into this little pond scene. Oh my god, it's a gigantic uh, modified <laughs> DNA dandelion. <laughs> a GMO dandelion as, as it were. A dadgum GMO dandelion. So I can move him around and reposition him. If I'm a clever girl, I, will, I could make this into a smart object. And Yay! Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So one of the things about smart objects is that it does not give you free reign to enlarge something, you know, 500%, but it means you can always get back to, to where you are. So once you get it in, that's the best it's ever going to be. So in the indistinct icon for the layers panel menu, I'm just going to say that I want to convert this to a smart object. Oh, well, that saves me from going up the top menu, I always oh, okay. to do that. So yeah. I already, well, I'm just so tickled that I can see that corner at my age that I use it every time I can. <laughs> so you'll see that it has that ornament on it that tells you that it's a smart object. You think, oh, but I've lost my mask. Not really. The way it's represented here, it looks that way. But if I double click it, it brings it up you know, intact. So I, I tell people smart object is kind of like it has the image off in the pantry and it can go get it. So I'm not going to do anything to it, but just so you know, you do still have your mask. So if you needed to tune it up, That's oh, great. and I should bring this up too. The fact that the mask is separate from the pictorial pixels of this layer. If you take a look over here, there's this little link. If I click on the mask, these have gotten more subtle over the years. Those little brackets around it mean if I were to paint with black or white now, I'd affect the mask. Mm -hmm. If I click on the image, if I paint with black or white now, I'm going to screw up the image. So if you start tuning up the mask, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. but if you want to just look at that mask again, if you hold down Option or Alt and click on the little black and white mask thumbnail, now you're looking at the mask again. You re-Option or Alt click, you're back to the bang. If you Shift click on that thumbnail, it disables it. And see, all those pixels are still there. Re-click and you're back in business. So I'm doing this on the smart object, the little embedded guy, but it, it works mm -hmm. on the original as well. So the advantage of making it a smart object, I didn't really do anything, is now if I want to scale it down, I can. So just do my Command or Control T to get my uh, little transform, hold down Shift, put it over here where the fish can eat it, mm -hmm. and then hit Enter to commit. So I'm a big InDesign user. So if I have to silhouette something like this to put it in InDesign, this is how I'm going to do it, and just put the PSD directly in InDesign. Uh, for me, pretty much the days of clipping paths are gone. I think this is a much more realistic uh, map. See some translucency around there? See where the background's showing? Mm -hmm. Much more realistic result. Does it matter if you're going to InDesign which format that masked image is in? Save it as a PSD. And this is after 
15 years of us beating designers in, about the head and shoulders and telling them thou shalt use TIFFs and EPSs. And no, we're over that now. So I use PSDs all the time for, for my images and coming out of Illustrator, or I use AIs. And one of the huge benefits, if you have a multi-layer Photoshop file, in InDesign, you can turn the visibility of those layers off and on without going back to Photoshop. And the Ooh. same thing's true for an AI. Because the truth is, you can have layers in TIFFs, which frankly I think is against nature. <laughs> they should just be flat. I think that's creepy. But even though you can have layers and you can have transparency in a TIFF, InDesign won't let you control the visibility like you can with a PSD. So I'm just, I'm PSD all the way. So Cool. You know, I was wondering, can you hear me now? I don't know. Looks like maybe you froze. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear yeah. you. So I was wondering, if you're working in a commercial print shop and somebody gives you a job, do you actually go in and do this sort of thing to their job, or do you expect them to have done this in advance? One would hope that they had done it, but uh, yeah, I've had to clean up many uh, a silhouette over the years where they did try to do this with the pen tool or the magic wand. Uh, and, and a lot of the time what they'll in the past at least, they'd say, they just sketch out, okay, I've got this image and that image and I want you to stick them together. And, you know, that that was really my specialty was retouching and color correction. For a brief period of time, my job title was actually Minister of Color, which is fairly hilarious. <laughs> but So it, what happens in the printing plant versus what the designer does, it depends on the capability of the designer or photographer and uh, you know, how you work in partnership with the printer. You know, who's best equipped to do it? Well, if you know how to do something like this, I think you are. And would you say that most um, print shops use Photoshop for this, or are they using some specialized program that works on their fancy schmancy printer? Nope. Uh, it's Photoshop anymore. In the olden days, it was cross-field uh, separation systems. I was like the first person in the U.S., I think, to run one of those. First person in the South, anyway. Woo, boy, million dollars. <laughs> But it was British, and if you've ever known anybody with a British sports car, <laughs> and you know what Lucas Electrics means, there were some moments. And <laughs> after that, we got uh, Cytex, uh, and at some point, you probably recall Cytex became a verb. Oh, Cytex this out, which was French for, I screwed up when I shot it, please fix the ding on the edge of the box. And then when, when I saw Photoshop, it was like, oh, I could be doing this at home and never sleep again. <laughs> and so I got Photoshop. Which is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> haven't slept since 1990, pretty much. Um, yeah. Got Photoshop 2 and never looked back. And there was this sort of cusp there. The systems were like, ooh, we were like the druids. We should have worn like black hooded robes. <gasps> oh, please retouch my image. <laughs> when Photoshop came out, it was like, oh, anybody could do this. And it, it really leveled the playing field. And it turned out that you could actually do things faster in Photoshop on my old nine, Quad 950 than you could do on uh, on the Cytex. So they sort of gave way to Photoshop. It, it changed the world. It changed the industry, definitely. Well, that's very useful because a lot of times people ask me when I'm teaching, should I save as a TIFF or as a Photoshop? document format and I because I don't know the world of print shops that well I'm never sure whether they need to save as tip and basically you're saying no that everyone's using Photoshop in the print shops you may as well save in the PSD format yep and so a couple of considerations how you save it really kind of depends on its destiny if, if you're sending it to somebody to stick into a PowerPoint file I can save this as a ping and maintain transparency and they can actually stick it in PowerPoint which is kind of interesting it, TIFF, you can put in pretty much anything on Earth. That, that's a you know, hugely supported format. Uh, but if you know that you're, you're going to feed it into Illustrator or InDesign, go for PSD. And people say, well, aren't they going to be huge? If you have 100 layers, yeah, probably so. Well, shouldn't I flatten it? it don't squeeze the life out of it. It's, we have huge hard drives. RAM is cheap. Take advantage of that flexibility and, and don't don't deny yourself any of that that safety net. You know, if I need to, if I come in here and go, oh, gosh, I wiped out part of the little stem. You know what? All I got to do is fix my mask. The stuff is still there, uh, which would be true in a TIFF as well. I think. I think you can do uh, layer masks in TIFFs, but I, I'm just sort of case hardened about PSDs. But it, what what, hap what happens if you if you save it with smart objects in it that maybe are tied to oh. an underlying raw well, and then send that file to somebody? Keep in mind that a smart object 
totally embeds the data of the smart object in the image. There's no link to the original file. It's going to fluff it up. There'll be a big lump in the middle, you know, like like a anaconda that just ate a goat. But uh, but it gives it's carrying it along with it. So the advantage is you have everything you need. That I wouldn't call it a disadvantage, but a consideration is because there's no link to the original file changing the original like if I change this to do something crazy to it that will not be reflected in this image because this is a copy of, of the dandelion data which is a phrase I bet you have never heard <laughs> dandelion <laughs> data so if I do something screwy like that oh look pink that's kinda cute so if I save this this stays pink nothing happens over here because it's duplicate information so it's, okay. that's it's utterly self-contained and the same thing would be true of the raw your original raw file would be a standalone file the copy of that raw data that's inside a Photoshop mm -hmm. file if you put it in as a smart object is its own little critter does that make sense oh yeah yes, it does. So I have another question and that is would you think it's correct to tell people that under the hood selections and masks are virtually the same thing they are just different ways to see, you know, or to display uh, the uh, the idea of isolating part of an image. The, and isolating is the key word. So a selection is a live selection. It's uh, it's a temporary selection if you don't save it as an alpha channel. But you're right. It isolates part of the image, so you can change the color of something, or you can copy it and put it elsewhere in the document. And the mask. So the distinction I would make would be a mask would be the tangible. Uh, having saved your active selection as a channel so you could always get it back later. So. Yeah, I think that helps people to understand what a mask or a channel, or what a mask is, um, yep. which most people I've seen when they teach, they never talk about that part. It's just kind of assumed you know, and I don't think everybody knows. Um, I think in general, as teachers, we tend to assume that people know way more detail than they do yeah. uh, because they're not devoting their lives to this stuff like they <laughs> Because right? they sleep, unlike us. That's well, correct. And I have said for a long time, I, I think I something better right after I learned it because I remember what it was. We take for, that we assume, uh, it's not necessarily true for everybody. So so that, I to, to kind of follow up on that, that selection, a lousy selection, but, <laughs> but a selection nonetheless. I Marching ants, I'd call a selection if I save this as uh, an alpha channel, I'd call that a mask. So if you were now to go to the channels panel, go ahead and click on channels panel, mm -hmm. you would not see the alpha channel yet. You would have to go right. up to select, save selection, and then that selection would be right. um, and displayed there he is. as an alpha channel. Yeah. Yep. Does that help? I mean, I, I think, I don't think it's a bad thing to use them intercha interchangeably, but uh, it's, I mean, since you posed the question, that is kind of how I think. I've always saved it as a mask and put it on a layer and so this is a much more elegant way of doing it. Well, how do you how do you mean you say Well, I just leave it as a mask. I put it I, I make I make it oh, to oh, a mask. You, in, oh, you, so you in a layer. Oh, you do a layer see. mask. She's talking about layer masks. And that's well, why I switch it over to layer mask. Well, of course that's what I did with this. I made a layer mask. But Yeah, uh, but I never save it in the alpha channels area and when you're working on something. Oh, I see that. what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. Right. And and the thing is if I if I come over here I actually have something unnecessary. I'm glad you brought that up because once that mask is utilized as, or once that you you know you've restored it as an active selection, and then you nail it down as a layer mask. If you ever need it again, you could always reclaim it from that layer mask. You actually could afford to get rid of your alpha channel now, and yeah, it's gone. So if I needed this again, what I could do is I could command or control click the little thumbnail itself and that'll load it. That'll load the transparency of that that layer. So I can always get it back if I need it. So like if I needed to color correct this, I could or just part of it, I could get it back. But Claudia, I can can you guys see your screen? I can't see your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just seeing it, but a second ago I didn't, but now I did. Well, anyway, so my question now, and these aren't really my questions. I'm trying to get you to say these things. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and I'm trying to read your mind. Um, so, so when there is a layer mask, if one were to, if there were no saved selection, it's just a layer mask. If one were to look at the channels panel, would they also see an alpha channel with that mask? If I had just made a, a selection, you know, like Erica was talking about. So let me come over here, and I'll get rid of 
this one to, to mimic what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. If I if I do world's worst selection here, and it's then okay. yes, <laughs> we'll pretend like it's like a cooking show. Yours won't be burned well, on the I'm outside and raw in the middle. That, believe me. <laughs> it's okay. Me too. So if I just double click my background, that makes it a floater. And then without having to save that as, as a tangible uh, channel, I can just come down here, oops, every application, hit that little uh, make a layer mask, and there we go. And so there is, it never did pass through uh, living as a standalone channel. Okay. So, well, it kind of does. It says layer zero mask. Yeah, so it, but it's, I didn't manually save it as a channel. Uh, it, you're right, it is a, it's a tangible thing, so I could duplicate this to make an, another channel and so forth, so I can get at it if I need to. I need to spend more time digging into this. I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface. Masks are your friends, I'm telling you, and layer masks, the beauty of them, of course, is that they're non-destructive. If I shift-click, everybody's still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use them, but I feel like I barely... I need, feel like I needed a very in-depth from the start class on just masking and layers and I can do the selections but it's all the storage and the using and everything that you can utilize with it I feel like I could use a lot more knowledge. No, I think you're right I think it's confusing you know what is it what is the relationship between a selection a layer mask and an alpha channel that mm -hmm. those are the issues as I see them and there are a couple of resources that I know of um, of course there's Claudia and her her site practicalia.net is it? Yes, because some guy in Great Britain bought .com. I actually just recently bought it, finally. But you know. <laughs> so she's got some uh, tutorials. Then there is um, uh, on Lynda.com. I think Deke McClelland has done at least one, if not more, courses on totally on masking. Uh, and he's a great teacher, and he goes into it, you know, ad nauseum, all the different kind of masks. Oh, Deke is the king. <laughs> he sits right next to me. We're both from Boulder, and so we, we're often in the studio together. And he is a very smart man and a nice man and a good explainer. So yep. there's that. And then um, I think there is a book by Scott Kelby all about channels and masking. Okay. It's a couple of versions of Photoshop ago, but you know that also goes into this kind of detail. So those are the resources that I look at about masking. Yeah, because I've been using, I've been using like, I saw Lee Varis speak live, and I learned some really cool things you can do applying the alpha, the different channels and the color channels and masking to achieve different looks to your photos instead of using, um, you know, the brushes and the layers, using the alpha channels as masks in layers, you know, to achieve different looks. And so it's just, I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface of what I can do. But, you know, so the way I think about this is all of this stuff is so complicated, and most people don't understand it. So what I love about Lightroom is, <laughs> is you don't have to know that. I mean, who cares? No, you don't. I just want to move the fork and sliders and get a good-looking photo. You know what I mean? Yeah, I but I'm, I'm at a point yes. now where I'm needing to bridge further than that to right. go from good to great. Right. And so it's, it's, it's like it's the difference between, you know, it's the difference between a good, really good pudding in creme brulee. You know, it's like you want to get there. No, I agree. And I'll tell you something, Eric. What, how do I know what I know? I read every single book. I read, yeah. I listen to every single video. I make friends with people like Claudia who know more than I do, and I get <laughs> yeah. them. And um, I, one of my secret resources is a thing called creativeedge.com, which okay. is, uh, I don't know, it's like a book site where you can actually see the content of all the books published by... I don't know, is it Peach Pit Press or Pearson or somebody who has most of the actual books on mm -hmm. stuff. And you can read them all online. And you pay a little bit every month rather than going to the bookstore and buying $50 books. So those are all the things. You know, it's like doing a giant research project. <laughs> I, I try and spend, I, you know, it's like I don't feel like I'm doing well unless I'm spending two hours a day, you know, digging in and learning. And, you know, that's a challenging thing to keep up. <laughs> It is, but that's why I'm trying to share the ones I think are worth looking at. That's See, perfect. It helps a lot. Yeah. If we just didn't have to sleep, I'm voting for like the metric hundred hour <laughs> I day. I would love it. But yeah. I get a I get a little testy after that. So I'll show you one more thing. 
Please. something you often want to do, because I will go all night and people will mm -hmm. start hanging up, but if you want to provide a common edge to multiple layers, uh, they've kind of changed the name of this over the okay. years. Originally it was called clipping group and then it's layer groups and then it's, I forget what it is. But here's, here's the concept and it's a bizarre one. Um, edge of that what the heck so I will go to oh you know what I'll use refine edge anytime you have a selection tool chosen and you have marching ants I think you can actually look up marching ants in the help guide if you click on refine edge this is one more way that you could uh, give yourself you can refine the edge of course but I, I just, use that it's 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 good it's, but it's not as good as your other methods yes it's the smart radius like I said when I first saw that I thought, oh my life is over and then I thought, can beat that. So I feel better now. But your so, life had just begun if it worked, because then you wouldn't be spending so much time on your computer. <laughs> oh, I, I make acrobat forms, party girl that I am. But I'm Irish, so I would be drinking Bailey's while I did it. Okay. So, so here, and this is, I'm going to get rid of all these little extraneous layers. So here's the concept. When we think of masks, or at least when I think of masks, I think of something above the image. You know, like you frame and mat a watercolor. The mm -hmm. mat is above the watercolor. You see the watercolor through the hole in the mat. Mm -hmm. This thing shouts up from under, which is kind of weird. So I've made this this blob. Doesn't matter the color of the blob. What's at play here is occupied space and transparency, which yeah. means nothing until you see this happen. So what you do is you, the icon has changed over the years. You hover, and I'm going to need the option key, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do because you won't be able to hear me when I do it. You hover your cursor over the dividing line. In this case, the mask kind of shouts up from under. You hover your cursor on the dividing line between, in this case, layer 2 and layer 0. You hold down option or alt, and when you see that mystery symbol, you click. Now that's how it looks in CC. Finally, after many years it makes sense. In previous versions what you're going to see is two little overlapping circles and a little arrowhead which I have for years said the called the mystery symbol. So when you anytime you see something weird and you option you know, as you option click on that dividing line between layers you're going to make this happen. So the difference here so see how it made a mask for for my uh, my first layer but then I want to move this guy over so I can get him in just to kind of prove a point. I can keep piling them up and the bottommost layer is still going to be the mask for it. So again, I'm going to hover my cursor at the dividing line, hold down Option or Alt until I see a mystery symbol and click. So now that, that bottommost layer is a mask for all the layers I keep incorporating into, into this little assembly. But they're still separate, so if I get my Move tool, I can move the little dandelion around and wherever he falls outside that magical area, he's going to disappear. Would I be obnoxious to ask the question why? Like I, I see, I see that it works, but what was the? But gosh, it's ugly. Why would I do it? Uh, let's say that you no, had. Not, a, yeah, I mean, but why is the tool there? Like it's. Well, people use it, for example, to have image appear inside of thick fonts of text, or okay. image appear mm -hmm. inside of a shape. Those would be two. Okay, perfect. Okay, that's okay. That's that makes. Yeah, sense. inside text or. Uh, it, like if you had to do the old-fashioned vignette, you know, the oval vignette, okay. so, and you, you could composite you some could, things within it. Perfect. So you could also just type, instead of using a big blob, you could have big fatty text, and then the image would appear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Derail it, you just, uh, you know, to disable it, you just do the option or alt click again and see everything's all back. So, yeah, text would be the common thing. So if I came in here and made a big tacky text layer, I can't think of any. So I'll just say text and make this something really hideous like, hmm, do you think I have enough fonts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, of course I can't see it, so you just have to believe it's there. Yex I was off oh, a roll. Oh, Yexy! <laughs> <laughs> you know what's on your mind. There's been no Bailey's tonight, so that's what <laughs> so, Again, kind of making the point that it does not matter what color right. it is. Each letter could be the, you know, a different color. Uh -huh. But then all I have to do is do that option click. And there Wonderful. we go. Wonderful. And oh. so if I move 
That's great. Page one of these. So now if I'm in the text layer and I move it, we're going to see a different part of the assembly. That's wonderful. The thing, the thing you have to overcome is the seeming lack of logic that the masking thing yeah, that's is what below. I was weird. I just weirded out by, but that's from, wonderful. Yeah, it's it's weird, but it works really well. So just think of it as as a good way to provide a common edge. You just get these things all piled up, and then take your bottommost floating layer, and do the shape there that's going to provide the common edge. And there you go. And anything you do to that shape, uh, you know, feather it or put a drop shadow under it because we have to put drop shadows under things. <laughs> Ever since InDesign two. Remember that when InDesign 2 came out and you'd pick up a magazine and go, you just bought InDesign, didn't you? Oh, <laughs> here's a little trick about shadows, too, that a lot of folks don't know. You know, if you're trying to get it where you want it, you keep moving the sun here. You know what's a way better way? Just reach back here into the image and just drag Ooh, that little right. rascal and move Love it. Love it. Yep. So details. It's the little details. That's why we pay her the big bucks. <laughs> Yeah. This is why I show up on Tuesday, on Tuesday nights. <laughs> but that's, I mean, because we believe that we can't reach outside a dialogue, and for the most yeah. part, we can't. But, Usually, you can't, yeah. Yeah, but what the, because it goes bump, bump, and there's this Pavlovian response, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I clicked. Yeah. And so you don't do it. But it works for this. I wish it worked in InDesign like this, that you could reach back and grab it, but it doesn't. But what the heck. Mm -hmm. So there you go, and if you don't shut me up, I will go all night. And gosh, oh no, it's, it's so fun! You are such okay. a good. I love these techniques. But I must say, we probably <laughs> we probably do need to go because you know we have a people are sick of this by now. So yeah. I should unscreen share myself. Yeah, unscreen share. Uh, but Claudia, if you, I know you have more, and if you want to come back and share more, we would love to have you anytime. You tell us, like, don't wait there until okay. you get an email. Just say <laughs> don't, hey. wait, don't sit by the phone waiting for it to ring. Okay, so <laughs> am, I, am I unscreen shared now? Am I off? Yeah, yeah, we see okay. you. Okay. Oh, I hit the right button. How exciting. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can see you now. Yes. Well, thanks for Thank inviting me. Thank you. I learned so much. I always learn so much, but I really loved you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they liked me. They really liked yes. me. Oh, I just went full uh, Sally, what's her name, Anya. <laughs> what is her no, name? Like Claudia, oh, you should look at, um, what er look at Erica, what is your website? It's just my name, ericathornis.com. You should see the stuff she's doing. I mean, it's really interesting and good. These composites where her children look like little miniature people yeah, in giant so cool. scenes. It's so Those cool. So much fun. And so she really will use this stuff. So you have. I will. Well, <laughs> Give me a shout if I if I can talk you down off the ledge if you know things. Well, thank you, on. thank you. Yeah, my I had an underwater composite win first prize in the San Diego Fair this year. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, out of like sixteen hundred entries, so that's kind of fun. That's awesome. Excellent. So it's fun. So I do actually use all these compositing techniques, and I will be using these shortcuts. So I Yay. really appreciate hearing what you're doing. You bet. Well, this was great. This was fun, and um. I'm very glad that you're a member of the Lynda.com family and that we can go there and Me listen too. to your videos in case we don't remember everything. Beautiful <laughs> voice. You guys hire the people with the most beautiful voices. Oh, thank you. I always thought I sounded like Zelda on Dobie Gillis, but nobody remembers that. Uh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember. Okay, when you were a child, too. Yeah. It's true. All right, so we are going to uh, go now, but I want to remind people that if they didn't catch any part of this show, they can watch it again on YouTube, on Ron Clifford's channel, or on my channel, which for some obscure reason is J. Kabili 1, the numeral 1. Like um, there's another one? There's not another one of you. No, that's just the only one, and that's what they make they call me on, on YouTube. I can't change it. However, um, there are 36 episodes, and there is some amazing... Ooh unrepeatable stuff. We've been so lucky to have great guests one after the other. Um, it's a real resource. And now you're added to it, Claudia. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm proud to be in, in such fine company. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything they want to tell us about what's coming up for them next? I don't no? know. I kind of tapped myself out because I focused on the three mentorships in one month. It's going to be crazy. Um, so my only thing was I do have a couple of openings left on my full mentorship for Enhancing creativity. Other than that, that's what I'm going to be doing for the next six to eight weeks. <laughs> Terrific. Well, I'm going back into the studio to record courses on Photoshop Elements. Oh, boy. And I'm going to go practice my masking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, lots of masking to do. 
All right, everybody. Well, thank you, and go, uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you to all our viewers. Um, oh, I will remind you to please take a look at the Photoshop and Lightroom users community on G+. That uh, Ron and I are, uh, what are we, curators of? I guess you would call it. Moderators, yeah. <clears throat> Moderators, and we have over thirty-one thousand members now around wow. the world. It's an amazing community. So I'm very proud of that. Um, in addition to everything else that we do on Google+, we mm -hmm. love Google. All right. Bye. All right. Well, bye. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Okay. Good night. Good night.